every year, millions of pounds of money and millions of hours of time are spent trying to get more young people and children in science. But is this a good investment? I want to start my talk by sharing with you a story from one young woman that we'll call Danielle. So Danielle is a white working class 16 year old girl. She lives in England and we've been interviewing her for our studies since she was 10. From a really young age, Danielle has been passionate about science. It's always been her favorite subject. She's also had dreams from a young age of becoming a marine biologist. She's got a very supportive mother, although there are no scientists in her family currently. But despite her dreams, as she grows older, Danielle comes to realize that science is not for her. As she goes through secondary school, she starts to think, though, I'm not brainy enough to do science. She goes to a school science club once, but there are no other girls there. She has no one to talk to, so she doesn't go back again. And over time, she comes to develop alternative non-science aspirations. Now, Danielle is just one girl, but her story illustrates something that we've found with thousands and thousands of young people, namely that they don't see science as being for them. But should we care whether young people want to go into science or not? Does it matter? Well, across the world, governments and industry are really worried about this. They're really concerned that not enough young people are going into science, technology, engineering, and maths, the STEM subjects, and they worry that if we don't have enough young people choosing these subjects and taking degrees and so on in the future, we're going to have a really big STEM skills gap. And this will affect national economic competitiveness. There's also a social justice argument. Currently, participation, for example, at degree level, is really unbalanced. So we have the people who are doing degrees in, for example, the physical sciences and engineering are much more likely to be middle-class males, particularly from white and South Asian backgrounds in England. And this is, a, this is a problem socially. Shouldn't all areas be open to everyone? Shouldn't be getting the talents of everyone into these areas? So what makes one child choose to continue with science and another not? Why are our aspiring scientists and engineers so often middle-class boys? And why is the idea of becoming a scientist so unthinkable for so many young people? And most importantly, what can we do about it? Well, these are questions that myself and my colleagues, we've been trying to address in a number of research studies that we've been doing. And we think we've got a potential new answer, science capital. So to date, most of the efforts that have been put into trying to engage young people with science have really focused on trying to make science more fun. So you might have tried some of these yourself. You might have watched one of those programs on TV where they blow stuff up spectacularly. You might have been putting the mint sweets into the cola bottles and making the big fountains or making slime or goo at home. But our Aspire's research studies suggest that this approach might not be sufficient and it may even be misguided if we want to get more young people into science. So since 2009, we've been conducting large-scale national surveys. We've surveyed over 30,000 young people to date. And we've also been conducting in-depth interviews with those young people as they move from 10 through up to 19. And we found that lack of interest in science is not the problem. So if you look at the graph here, so the different colored bars represent children at different ages through from 10 to 16 in this case. And across a range of these questions that we ask them, we find that if you look at the first block of columns, actually, most young people find science really interesting. So for example, the first set of bars, over 70% are saying things like, the science I learn in class is really interesting. They've also predominantly, as the second block of bars shows, got parents who are supportive. They've got supportive home context. For example, that one, my parents think it's important for me to learn science. It's also not the case that they're being massively put up off by really negative images of scientists as these geeky people that they don't want to become. They have a range of positive views of scientists. So the third block, just an example there, scientists uh, do valuable work. Lots of them also think scientists earn a lot of money. Not all the scientists agree with that, but <laughs> it's the perception. But none of these positive views seems to translate into wanting to be a scientist. You can see by the final pitifully small set of blocks, there's this massive difference between I enjoy doing science, I just don't want to be a scientist. So we want to understand what creates this difference. 
and we think science capital could help us understand that. So what is science capital? Well, the idea draws on the work of the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. So for Bourdieu, capital was one of the important parts of understanding what creates social inequalities in society. He said there are different sorts of capital. So there's economic, like the money you have, cultural capital, so like the, the cultural knowledge or qualifications that you have, and social capital, who you know. And together, the more you have of the right sort of capital, the better you're able to get on in society. Now, for Bourdieu, he conceptualised particularly cultural capital really as an arts-based form of resource. So in terms of whether you go to the opera, whether you appreciate fine art and so on. We've now extended the concept to cover science-related forms of capital. So in the Enterprising Science Project, we think of science capital as a bit like a hold-all or a bag into which you can put all your science-related experiences, interests, knowledge, resources, and so on. So in your bag, your hold-all, it's a bit like you have four main pockets. So the first is what science you know. So this is your scientific literacy, how you understand science, what you can do with it. The next is who you know. So do you know, for example, people who work in science-related jobs? Do you have lots of people in your normal, everyday life that you chat about, to, uh, about the science with? It's also how you think about science, so your attitudes and your dispositions, how much you value it in your everyday life, for example. And finally, what you do. So what science-related activities do you do in your spare time? Do you watch science TV programmes? Do you go to science centres and museums? So how much and what sort of science capital you have is shaped by home, school and everyday contexts. The science capital isn't fixed. You can keep acquiring more, putting more in your bag as you go through life. But also the value of your science capital isn't fixed. So very much like a financial currency, it depends on the context you're in as to what its value is. So depending on where and when you are, it will have a different value. So how does science capital relate to who continues with science or not? Well, our studies suggest that a young person who has high science capital is significantly more likely to want to study science in the future and to think of themselves as being a science person, what we call have a science identity. So, for example, our survey suggests that half of all the students with high science capital plan on taking a degree in science at university, compared to just 6% of students with low science capital. Likewise, a whopping 80% of students with high science capital have a science identity, for example, say other people would describe me as a science person. And this compares with a tiny 3% of students with low science capital. We've also found that science capital varies dramatically between different social groups. So how much science capital do young people have? Well, we conducted a national survey in England of over 3,500 11 to 15-year-olds, and we found that only 5% have high science capital, and these are most likely to be middle-class boys from white and South Asian backgrounds. The most, 68% of students, had medium levels of science capital. But over a quarter, 27%, had low science capital, which we see as a really worryingly high proportion. Our analysis also suggests that this doesn't look like it will sort itself out over time. It looks like these trends increase and exacerbate as children get older. So what can we do about it? Well, our analysis suggests that fun approaches may be limited in, term of, in terms of increasing participation in science. We think it would be better to try and build young people's science capital. Well, how can you do this? Well, in the Enterprising Science Project, We've been developing and testing out approaches by working with teachers. We're trying to get them to integrate science capital building activities into their everyday teaching. So this isn't just a case of making some fancy new materials or creating some really spectacular fun one-off lessons. We think it's really about a change in mindset. We want to complement and enhance what teachers and science educators already do in their everyday practice, whether that's in the classroom or out of school. And key to our approach is valuing the identities, the knowledge, the experience that students bring with them into the classroom. 
and then linking these to science and highlighting the relevance of science to all students' lives. And in this way, we think we'll build science capital. We're also going to be sharing our surveys with people. So if you're in a science organisation that's trying to engage more young people with it, you can use our surveys and test out, well, are you building science capital or are you just boosting their interest? So should we keep on heavily investing in approaches trying to make science more fun? Well, there's nothing wrong with fun. Fun's a good thing, and obviously making science fun is good, but it's unlikely to make much difference to increasing the numbers of young people or widening the breadth of young people who go into science in the future. We see the new challenge as trying to build science capital. We want to help more young people see science as being for me, but particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds. And what about Danielle, whose story I started with at the beginning? Can we really just continue to celebrate her interest in science while ignoring her real sense of exclusion from it? For me, that would be a profound social injustice and one which we can't afford, either economically or socially, to ignore for much longer. Thank you.